Kia ora tātou. Welcome along everyone. Thank you for joining us for findings from the Aotearoa New Zealand Histories Regional Resource Stock Take. My name is Tara Fagan. I'm Chair of Te Putiaki Manatonga, the Association of Educators Beyond the Classroom. Just as we get started and just prior to Karakia, I'd like to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube. However, Mal goes through them and blanks out everybody's faces. So if you're, you're a guest and you're online, uh, your faces won't be seen, but our presenters will be. Um, but we'll go ahead with Karakia. Whakatakati hau ki te uru, whakatakati hau ki te tonga, ki a mākina ki na ki uta, ki a mātara tāra ki tai, i hi a ki ana, ti atakura, hi tio, hi huka, hi hauhu, ti hei Māori ora. Kia ora everyone and welcome. What a webinar session have we got for you today. To start off with, I'd like to welcome our guests. So we've got our normal Te Puti Akimana Tonga crowd, but we've also got guests from National Services Te Bairangi, Membership and Museums Aotearoa. So thank you for coming and joining us in this session today. It's been a, it's a real delight and I'm really looking forward to this session. Today we've got Liz Ward and Carol Neal. Both Liz and Carol have worked on a, a rather ambitious project, I would like to say, they may not agree with me, rather ambitious project around for the Ministry of Education around a resource stock take, regional resource stock take for Aotearoa New Zealand histories. So they're going to share their processes with us today, um, their findings and outcomes and next steps in that. Um, I'm going to let both Liz and Carol introduce themselves. So we'll go through the session. If you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And if we've got time at the end, we will, Carol and, Neil, uh, Carol and Liz will both be able to answer them for us. So kia ora, over to you, Carol and Liz. Kia ora, I'll just share my slide. I hope that will work. Okay, tēnā koutou katoa, whakawhatai mō te mātou i kōna i tēnei rā. Ko taupere i te maunga, ko Waikato te awa, ko Tainui te waka, ko Ngāti Mahuta te iwi, ko te tui o te rangi, taku tipuna tāne, ko Carol Neal taku ingoa, ko te wānanga Aurunui o Tamaki Makaurau me te kura mātauranga aho e mahi ana, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thanks so much for having us here. As I said, my name's Carol. I am, even though I was at Massey, I'm now at AUT in the School of Education, but lucky for me, my working relationships with Massey and particularly Liz and others has continued on into this year. So I'll just hand over to you, Liz, to introduce yourself. Yep, uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko rimu taka timanga, uh, ko te awa kairangi te awa. Uh, ki papi papa ioia uh, kainga and I and a uh, ko Liz Ward taka inoa uh, ki te kura hukinga tangata ki te oh, sorry I always struggle with this one <laughs> kuninga ki pu, puri huroa i mahi and I tina koto tina koto tina koto katoa uh, so my name's Liz um, and I also work at Massey and I've been fortunate enough to be working with um, Carol on this project for probably 18 months now I think we spent on it in the end um, yeah and I as said work at Massey and I'm in the School of Humanities um, specifically the School of uh, the, oh, I think it's called the College of Humanities isn't it and the School of Humanities create uh, media and creative arts how's that in the history program <laughs> so yeah um, it's a pleasure to share um, what we've uh, learned today. Thanks, Liz. So Liz and I are going to share around a little bit. We've designated each other different slides and I'll, I'll just run through, first of all, to start telling you a little bit about our work in general, to put it in context. So in 2021, early 2021, our team was contracted by the Ministry of Education to conduct the Aotearoa New Zealand Histories Regional Resources Stock Take. At that stage, it was going to finish by the end of last year. So COVID, et cetera, all sorts of things have met, meant it's run longer. But um, as Tara mentioned, you know, ambitious is, is probably an understatement. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a, quite a journey. So the graphic here shows what were put down as essentially the suite 
of initiatives that the ministry wanted to pursue in order to provide supports for teachers in um, implementing the Aotearoa New Zealand Histories curriculum. You can see there's different colours there and those mean different things. To a large extent, that most of them were about either guiding the schools with implementation with the resources or providing specific teaching resources. So ours was a little bit different. It was more of a scoping exercise to find out really what was out there in terms of existing local history resources. So that's essentially what we thought of it as, as, as really exploring the local histories landscape across all Aotearoa regions. And the idea behind that is, and, and and as I understand is still behind it, is that what we found will be recorded into some type of online repository that would also be a living document that could be added to that teachers would be able to access. So our team were from Massey University, a small team really of mainly history, academics and education academics as well. And we also had an advisory group from across the sector uh, of historians, professionals from the National Library, Te Papa, the education sector. And also amongst that group were people who could represent um, Māori, Pacifica and Asian perspectives. A reality for our team is that the main core of us were, were quite conversant and have specialised in Aotearoa New Zealand history in our careers, but quite often not deeply at the local level, often engaging more with the national narrative. And I'd have to say as a broad generalisation that that's often where academic history, New Zealand history has tended to sit. So it was really exciting for us to really go looking at what was happening on the ground level um, and also quite new terrain that really what we found and, and what will unfold is that that terrain was extremely different just like like our, our geological or geographical terrain is as well. A couple of things to note that were out of scope for our research. So we discussed and agreed with the ministry that we would not be directly going to iwi, hapu, mana whenua to ask about their histories. You know, we, we agreed that that was something that needed to be a relationship that the ministry developed and, you know, developed from what they already have and maintained. Um, and, and, and it wasn't for anyone to go knocking on you know, iwi or hapu or Fano doors to ask them to share their histories. Um, so we agreed that the ministry would take the lead in that and we would only record what we found sort of incidentally. And that eventually came to be the same agreement with um, Pacific communities as well, that the Ministry of Education would work with the Ministry of Pacific Peoples and their regional and local representatives who engage with the communities. Um, to identify the resources that they wish to share, which we know incidentally of many wonderful things, but we didn't want to um, be rushing in to do that as well. So what we did do in our research was focus on local history of really around local community history institutions and we agreed early on that museums would be our first port of call. So our idea was that we expected museums would be the hubs of community history work and that if and they'd also have a sense of what else was going on in the communities, who else we could engage with. And, and we found that to be true. With libraries, we engaged early on with the National Library and found that they were doing some of their own work in terms of scoping out what, what resources they had within libraries. So we also didn't, we did engage with libraries, but it wasn't such a specifically strategic focus as it was with museums. Um, it was interesting to note that the, the diversity across different communities of how libraries engage with history the local history as well and that might be something we want to talk about later um, sometimes really strong relationships with the museums sometimes it's more operating on their own so so it was a very interesting thing but we we tended to focus more on the museums than the libraries is, is what i'm trying to say we did reach out to diverse community groups we reached out to historical societies we also reached out to um, migrant groups etc as well. The main 
um, way that we pursued our research in the first instance is what many of you will probably know about is that we um, sent out invitations for a survey and we really thank all of you who took the time to complete those. We sent out muse um, surveys to 282 museums and received about a 50% response on that. We then followed up and did 130 visits between us around the country with different museums. Um, we tried to cover what the ministry has had as sort of the 10 regions, which covers the entire country. We weren't able to visit physically the west coast of the South Island, nor Raki or the Stewart Island or the Chatham Islands. But other than that, we, we covered as much as we could of, of the motu. So in all between our survey and the visits, about 170 museums were covered. So some we had visits and surveys, some we had just surveys sometimes, some we had just visits. Um, yeah, so we, of the engagement that we did with uh, out, the outreach to community groups, we had really good engagement with the Chinese community and Indian community and also Jewish community representatives. Uh, we had a good response from groups like the Society of New Zealand Authors who, who sent us um, books that they knew of or had written themselves that they thought should be included. Um, we also, it's really important to note because it was such a huge help that the Heritage New Zealand um, provided us with, with a lot of information about their properties across all of Aotearoa as well. And along with that work, we kind of had the checks and balances of the engagement with, for example, Te Putaki Manatanga and Museums Aotearoa as well as, lot, as well as a lot of other conversations. So in all of that, the key question that we really asked everyone we engaged with was what local history stories does your museum or community have and want to share as teaching resources for schools? So we essentially wanted to find out what those stories were, how they could be found locally, how they could be engaged with and accessed by schools. So Liz, I'll let you sort of go now to more about what how we found what we found yeah okay thanks carol yeah so the first thing i'm going to talk about kind of um i guess in the results uh and this is drawn from the report that we wrote for the ministry uh is we we once we kind of visited the museums and, and looked at at what we saw we kind of divided them into four different types um and some of these are quite broad uh, so we we put regional museums now those museums tend to be um, that usually large, although not always. Um, for example, Auckland Museum being the best example, um, a large uh, institution, uh, and they tend to also be perhaps a little bit older, um, like Otago Museums, the oldest in the country, uh, and um, perhaps I wouldn't necessarily say well funded, but they have a lot of staff that they can draw on for various things. Sometimes those overlap, you know, they um, say if you think about Pukiariki, um, the library and the archives and the museum kind of overlap a bit. Um, but in general, they, they've, they've got kind of like a, an institution that, that runs. I guess because of the their history and the staffing capabilities. Uh, the second one was artifact museums. Now these um, were museums that um, perhaps had emphasised more the collection of materials, um, and uh, uh, often um, they, we, we really noticed when we were the museum opened and that kind of thing. Uh, but there was a real, um, seemed to be quite a blossoming of interest in local history in New Zealand in the 1960s and 70s. And we thought that was probably related to the fact that the, uh, a lot of small places or even big places like Palmerston or bigger places, not that Palmerston was huge, um, were settled in the 1860s and 70s. So they were celebrating centenaries. Uh, so sometimes those artifact museums began as kind of the community going, oh, hold on a sec, you know, we've got all this local history around us and we've got all these things. Um, let's gather them together and start trying to tell the history of our area. Um, the third one was um, specialty museums and these tended to focus perhaps on 
uh, stories of migration or a particular people group. Now, these are quite a small group of museums, uh, the Waipu Museum, for example. Um, although the Holocaust Centre doesn't really talk about migration, again, they kind of focus on a particular um, experience within New Zealand. Uh, but I think that this could potentially be a growing area of museums as we begin to kind of explore the variety of histories that we have in New Zealand around migration. Um, I think those stories are coming out more. Um, and the fourth one, which is a huge category, we just couldn't think of a better way to describe these, and that's specific location museums. Uh, so these range from um, the historic village kinds. Uh, so the, the image that I've got on the bottom left, my left anyway, um, is of Cobblestones Museum. So that began with a historic building and, and a place and then more buildings were collected around it. So they're fairly common um, in New Zealand. Uh, again, they often date back to the 60s and 70s and a part of that awareness around historic places. And I guess at the time, perhaps best practice was to, to move the old buildings into one place. Uh, and then um, you get what we call perhaps the house museums on the, uh, on the opposite side of the slide as Catherine Mansfield House. Uh, so they're museums that are related to the particular building there in um, say Highwick in Auckland. Uh, both DOC and Heritage New Zealand have a large number of these um, kinds of specific location, the histories to do with the house or the building. And then within that, mentioning DOC, is the outside spaces, uh, the gold tailings, uh, the readouts, for example, the Queen's readout um, in Pocono, um, the, the memorials or places where things happened, like the Tangiwai disaster. Uh, so those are kind of, um, so if you think about the fact that, I mean, sometimes regional museums, because of their age, are actually in beautiful <laughs> historic buildings, but sometimes they're actually in, uh, old council buildings or um, something. Um, so the specific location museums, they're in the place that they are is, the, is kind of the history, um, as opposed to perhaps the things that have been collected, although sometimes it's a combination. Uh, so that we found um, there were really a lot of diverse ways of expressing local history um, and kind of just because you think of your museum doesn't mean it's a building or um, you know, or it might not be what you think of as a traditional building. Um, the other thing that we were really interested in, um, and again, you may have wondered why I was asking you questions about um, the running of your museum and uh, whether you, uh, who runs it and the history of that, um, because there was such a variety of governance models um, and particularly funding models. Um, and I think that this is, uh, something that what certainly surprised me was that um, in some places, uh, particularly where local government, local bodies, your district council, your city council was supportive, um, the museum sector tended to be in better health. Uh, so some um, uh, museums got, you know, they're, they're, they're actually run by the council um, and regional museums, that's sometimes the case, not always. Um, sometimes they're run by trust boards and they get grants, it, it depends on the model. Um, sometimes local trusts give them money. Uh, I remember one small museum I visited, the, the volunteer I talked to there uh, seemed to me to be spending an awful lot of time. She had a little book with all the little places she could apply for grants. Uh, so, you know, there was a really some places really run on very few funds um, and I would say in general the the sector is not well funded um, and not consistently funded um, and also that local body support doesn't necessarily have to be in the terms of money but it can also be in terms of facilitating um, the engagement between the museums and the district um, actually somebody taking usually these if, if if the district doesn't have a, its own museum, sometimes this comes out of the library kind of sector in the area. Um, and there did seem to me, and, and, and it's a little bit hard to tell because of the variation, but often a stronger library sector meant perhaps a stronger museum sector because the two of them, I mean, uh, as an engagement with local history. So if the library's engaging in local history, perhaps then there's somebody there who's, who's even just providing moral support to the museums and collegiality. Um, so yeah, so the other thing we just want to talk about here um, was the historical societies. Um, so we, we engaged with um, 
I think it's called the Federation of Historical Societies. Um, and there is, again, a quite a variety of some historical societies run museums. Um, and the middle image is actually of um, the museum at Matara, which is run by their local historical society. Uh, but some don't. Some work in conjunction with the museums. Some historical societies have changed their name and working alongside museums that are now parts of local bodies. Uh, so that was quite interesting, kind of, again, the diversity uh, in, in that interaction with local history, because often historical societies are a huge repository of local history, um, and they're often writing, so they, they might produce journals or um, uh, the Plymouth and Historical Society has quite a good website. Uh, so, you know, there's there's varying ways that they're communicating their research and work. Um, and I think the last thing I just want to say about this is that most museums we visited were volunteer run, and even the large museums have an army of volunteers. Um, and this sector is really run by volunteers. And I'm not, and that was, I think, a major thing that point we made to the ministry was that this is very much this learning about local history is very much going to be done at the goodwill of people who give their time um yeah oh am i the next slide too carol okay no carol no i am thanks liz <laughs> yeah so to just um move on on what we found around the education programs so we um not only found out about the education programs through the survey but this is one um this is one way that I can kind of quantify it. So 53 of 126 museums um, that answered this question in the survey indicated that they have local history education programs. Um, and then they gave us some descriptions of them. And the word cloud I made here is essentially all the words that came out of, of that. So you can see there's a lot, obviously, local histories there. But there's some interesting words that come up that, that I'll pick up on. Um, so. The interesting thing, I think, was that education programs could be defined in many ways. They could, and they could vary in many ways as well. So um, it could be simply that uh, it was described as that um, children or students or akonga were given worksheets um, or specific sort of, um, particularly the sort of treasure hunt type activity or something like that. But the those sort of minimalist descriptions were really in the minority. Most descriptions emphasised hands-on experiential learning in, in different forms. And in some cases, that was more about experiencing 19th century life in particular, um, around sort of clothing, around industry activities, around what school was like at the time. But what we really found um, most of all that kind of turned our questions on its head was when we asked educators what they had, they tended to say, what do you need? So we really discovered um, that museum educators are often incredibly agile, very well versed in what is in their museum collections, both front of house and, and in the stores, and what could be tailored to different learning needs of the schools, their teachers um, the, and the students. So while there were descriptions of how museums could ad adapt their education programs within the museum. We also found that a number of um, people talked about how their programs could also be taken outside the museum to specific physical sites in the region. And an example there is, for example, Waiuru Museum, which noted the Te Pōrere New Zealand Wars site and also the Tangiwa why disaster sites as places where they could meet schools and uh, for students to learn about those places. We found some really innovative activities happening, um, particularly where relationships were being built between the schools and museums and across communities. A couple of things that I just want to mention within this at this stage is the idea of sort of roving uh, museum educators that could outreach even further than just visiting sites. Um, for example, um, to support other museums or groups or, or organisations with school engagement. So particularly um, talking to the South Canterbury Museum educators, talking about how those very small museums that are volunteer run in their region, often they would um, go and support vis school visits in those areas, for example. 
Um, another thing that really impressed us was where education programs brought in students to help develop and look after the museums and their exhibits. We saw senior students helping with digitization and sort of those sort of behind the scenes things. Um, but we also in particularly um, impressed with Kaikoura Museum, which was telling us, for example, how Akonga from their local kura um, took basically kaitiaki roles with their exhibits in their museums. So really in that way, seeing that sort of res reciprocal relationships being built um, as, as ways of students learning, not just sort of receiving as they come into the museums. Um, we also saw some great examples of museum outreach programs, for example, Waimati Museum, even with their small uh, sort of um, only one staff member, I think, and, and um, the rest volunteers, creating an artifact box with activities that could go out to the local schools. And probably the even uh, more prominent example of that outreach was Hands on Tauranga, which without its um, physical museum, developing an amazing service for local Tauranga schools to receive boxes of artifacts and learning activities to support teachers uh, and students in learning around that area. So those were some of the key things that came out around the education programs. Liz. Okay, so the actual mandate from the ministry was to um, talk about, well, to let them know, uh, to build the database, what type of um, local history was actually available in museums. Uh, so I've kind of isolated here um, three, things I guess that we found um, about I guess this is quite a, this is a broad generalization I just want to say that up front um, so yeah so I think one of the the issues particularly store uh, museums telling local history can face is that in New Zealand the local history story can actually also be quite a nationalized story in other words settlers came, Maori land was alienated, the settlers cleared the land, they burnt the trees, they brought the sheep or the cows and lo and behold we are, we all now live here. Um, so that, that's a very common story um, throughout the whole of the country simply because of the landscape and the fact that it, that some of these things were promoted by the government and um, you know you, you can't kind of get away if you want to tell the foundation kind of story, the local history story of your place. Um, but I saw some really great examples of how they took that kind of more nationalised story and, and tried to make it relevant to the local area. Uh, so these are images that I took at Patea. Um, and the reason I took these is I saw so many saws. It was unbelievable. I think every museum in New Zealand has a saw. Um, but there's a reason for that because <laughs> they were so important to the development of the land um, and to what the landscape in New Zealand looks like today compared to what it looked like um, pre-treaty. So what, what they did was they, they had their source, but down here you can kind of see in the, in the information panel, they've localised it. So they've, they've got the information there about the source, but then they've got a story about how it was used in the local area and then an image of it actually being used. Uh, so I thought that that's... Uh, um, you know, those are good examples. And there are many um, artifacts that that are common throughout many museums. Uh, what was that with dental nurses' chairs? I saw an awful lot of those. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, I think that um, good the good local history we saw took those very common everyday things and, and built a local story around them. Um, and there, I can think of many ways that, that you could kind of do that. Um, another one that was quite interesting and we've kind of discussed as a team why this is um, and that is um, what period we look we we just talked about what periods of history were the main focus in general in museums um, and to be honest it is mostly still colonial kind of pioneer history now as I said that's a gross generalization it doesn't mean that every museum in New Zealand is like that uh, but there is definitely still a, a heavier weight on 19th century history um, and I think part of that is to do with public perceptions of what history is in other words history is old um, and perhaps the kinds of people who tend to visit museums um, from the general public uh, tend to be older so therefore it's got to be older than them 
um, but also possibly availability of artifacts um, and also perhaps the way that we have perceived history in the past as that kind of pioneer story that it's about taming the land and um so yeah so but there were some really noticeable exceptions but i think one thing um that i think and this is possibly a wider discussion for within the museum sector or even within new zealand in general is that the the learners the akonga that are coming into your museum were nearly all born and they will be pretty much within the next year or two in the 2010s okay they're born in the 21st century and in the second decade of the 21st century. To them, the 19th century is a very, very long time ago. Um, and on top of that, if we think about the fact that there's a lot of pioneer kind of colonial history, it does emphasise rural life. Um, and again, that's really understandable because many places began, I mean, Palmerston's a classic example, began as a small rural settlement um, and developed into a town. Uh, but most of the, the Akonga are going to be um, urban dwelling, diverse, um, ethnically diverse learners. They're not going to be, um, yeah, there. so kind of thinking about how we represent the 20th century. Uh, and I think, in, and actually in general, within the New Zealand history context, that's a discussion that, that's uh, that's bigger, you know, p the Pacifica migration story, for example, um, which is a story of the 60s and 1960s and 1970s. Uh, how, how do we represent those changes in our communities that were going on? Because uh, Pacifica people went to small places in the North Island to work in, factories and industry so you know let's recognize how do we recognize those and and make it relevant um so yes yeah, so there were some good examples i saw one at otaki museum where they um, had a display because um and from about the yeah in the 1950s in particular otaki was quite a popular holiday spot so they'd have bands and things like that and they they had a a, dis, uh, a really lovely display about the different bands that used to come and play and about kind of a, around tourism and holidays and i actually saw some really good some of the 20th century stuff i saw was actually focused on that aspect um of new zealand life so yes i think um, yeah, and it's a question for museums because you only have so much space and, you know, we're, we're only getting more history, um, it doesn't get any less, so how do we kind of um, present history that's um, going to engage um, the learners that are coming in? Um, and the last one's a, a bit of a trickier one, I think, and that's around who we're representing. Uh, so I think that many institutions, museums, uh, suffer and not just museums uh, suffer from this i i struggle with this even in research because it tends to be the wealthier people that leave behind um artifacts letters manuscripts what they wore um what they ate from because working class people wore those things out um they didn't keep them uh so yeah just making you know we it's easy and and I, I think that as a child, certainly I was fascinated by the lives of, of upper class people, probably wishing I was one, um, <laughs> and I had a beautiful dress. Um, but yeah, just thinking about what we're representing um, to the Akonga as they come in about the lives of people in the past uh, and and how pe and how most people lived. Um, it's it's lovely to see how other people lived and Heritage New Zealand does an amazing job of this. And from my own experience, um, I visited Kawa Island when I was six and I was, I loved it, I was blown away by the Governor Gray's house. But now I know of course that that was an incredibly select portion of New Zealand that I saw. Um, yeah, so I, again, just thinking about what what and whose local history is represented um in the in the museum oh the slide changed thank you Carol. <laughs> okay so i've got three examples of some really creative ways i saw of telling local history uh, so why do our museum um, have made a real effort to make the museum relevant to the community. So they went through a refit, and I, I went to look up how long ago it was, and I forgot. Uh, and basically, they decided that they wanted to display as much of their collection as they could, and they wanted to be uh, a repository. They didn't necessarily want to 
to own or to hold on to um, taonga that were in the community, but they wanted to be able to provide safe storage and preservation um, for four um, families or hapu that, that had um, taonga that in that way so what they they said is so there's a couple of ways they did that one of the very first ways they did was they don't have any entrance fee so you can wander in off the street at any time they're on the main street within the kind of walking shopping area very open and welcoming to try and encourage that um and then as you come in they've got this huge touch table that's um dealing with whakapapa so you can look up your family you can find if the museum has anything that relates to your family uh, so again, really trying to connect the idea that this is a place that holds the tonga of your community. Uh, and they also, they, as I said, they offer the service of um, caring, not necessarily owning, but I guess being kaitiaki. Um, and then if a family deposits something, they will open for members of that family, especially like they, they, they can arrange um, if you're having a family reunion, they can arrange to open the museum outside of opening hours, for example. So really engaging the, making the history really relevant to the local community. Um, the second one I chose was Featherston Museum. And the reason I chose that is that Featherston's a small rural town in uh, the South Wairapa. Uh, and it's, its story, its local history story, is a typical New Zealand story. You know, <laughs> It involves sheep and land alienation and saws and etc um but instead of having that as the main focus of their museum um they chose a, a particular slice of history that's unique to their area and that is that the japanese prisoner of war camp that was in new zealand during world war ii was just on the outskirts of featherston so that most of the space in their museum is don't is oh no i've lost the word i wanted to say it's given over to um to that story and they've they've got um, uh, material that was made or um, artifacts that were made by the local prisoners. They worked with the Japanese embassy to contact families. Um, they've, uh, you know, they've got the story of both really good perspectives. You know, they've got the Japanese and the New Zealand perspective because there was a riot and a New Zealand soldier was shot um, and sadly he died. Uh, so you said that I thought that when you are you've got your face with a story that's the same as your neighbors and the same as the people further up the uh the wire upper valley i thought that was a really unique way of an, of making an of a taking something that's a really good local history story um but also kind of um really working on those ideas of perspectives as well you know being critical about about the history that's there um, and the last one I chose uh, was uh, Tehikoi at uh, Apirima, um, because, and that's Riverton, that's in the very lower <laughs> part of the South Island, for those who don't know, because um, I thought, again, they had quite, it's not a story that's unique, particularly uh, to Apirima, um, but that it was one of the places um, of first contact between Māori and European because it was a whaling station and they did a, have a really excellent engaging um, use of audio visuals and displays uh, to, to to explain that and you know this the, again they've taken something and again this is not a unique story but they've really chosen the parts of their local history and made it engaging for um for learners of all age um and you know the the use they've got a film that you can watch and um and i know the use of um recreation kind of models is can be controversial but i think for you know it really gave a, a good feeling for what for what it would have been like um and again it's it's kind of a, a cross between what um Pateya and Featherston and that the story they have is is not super common I mean you know the those pre-contact whaling stations were throughout New Zealand but there weren't a lot of them uh, but they've really worked to to make it um the local history come alive I guess for um the the people that are coming through the museum right Carol oh I've got to say something here too don't I <laughs> Okay, um, so this is we have um, got two, or I've got two um, innovative relationships and collaborations that we observed, and actually both of them are in Otago Southland. Um, so uh, the Tutonu program, which is run out of Otago Museum, um, it was funded by uh, 
Manatu Tonga, uh, the Ministry for Culture and Heritage, and that enabled Otago Museum to fund someone to help the local regional museums. So as I travelled up um, through central Otago, the, everyone that I went to talked about it um, and the benefits that they were gaining from those collaborations, from the upskilling that they, they were getting. Um, but also, in some, I mean, Central Otago is growing, but it's, some parts are still quite, I wouldn't say they're remote, but you know, it's it's a, 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 bit, a big travel sometimes for them to get um, to other places. So yes, yeah, so they um, they really appreciated that. And you can I could see how those relationships were helping to build good local history practices as well. And the second one is in Southland, uh, where they have a roving museums officer called Jo Massey. Now she's actually employed or paid for by and I'm actually going to check their name again because it's I thought it was the Southland Community Trust but I think that they've changed their name and they call themselves now the Community Trust Southland anyway since 2006 they've um, provided funding for Jo and she, and basically she travels around Southland which has a lot of small museums and provides assistance. Uh, she provides networking. Uh, this is actually an area where the, the museums, are, they are small, but many of them have had earthquake issues with their buildings. Uh, so she's supported them in, in reconfiguring their buildings as they've gone back in. Um, and it, it really shows um, in, in the museums in that area um, and that they, it seemed to me that the, the volunteers were enthusiastic um, I think it was Wyndham where they're still struggling with their building and so they've instead they've been focusing on digitizing their collection and you know that's I thought that's quite innovative and and actually for me when I knew it was there I actually went and used some of it in my lectures um, because they've got beautiful uh, um, digital you know photographs of, of things that I can use to, for illustrations so um, yeah I think that in that that those building those connections um, and collaborations particularly amongst volunteer run museums uh, I think really helps um, it helps with skills and it helps with almost with morale you know that you've got other people to talk about um, museum things with okay Carol thanks Liz yeah and I just want to add a few more things about those great relationships and collaborations we saw um, particularly where uh, the collaborations were um, with the wider community and between mana whenua and the museums as well and really finding um, something that we often found was a separation between Pākehā sort of settler history and, and Māori history but these these are sort of examples where we see them being worked in or woven in together, if not you know, alongside each other at least. So first of all, the Ashburton Museum um, temporary exhibition that they held as um, part of showing the Ashburton area's sort of um, depiction of the Naitahu Cultural Mapping Initiative. And so that exhibition showed maps and explanations of Māori place names around that Ashburton area, which I think was really successful in expanding out what the permanent exhibitions show in terms of history. And even though it was just a temporary exhibition, it sort of provided these steps for the ways they could use that in future and use it as a resource and, and sort of think about that expanding out. So, so that was great to actually have my timing that I could see that when I was there. Um, Kaikoura Museum, I'll bring up again as an example, I was really impressed with them, how they reconfigured their museum to essentially, when after the earthquakes and was being rehoused, really taking the opportunity to think about their how their exhibits work and how they tell the stories and so therefore centering Māori history in a kind of concentric um, circles um, kind of layout which I, I was really um, taken with uh, and particularly therefore Māori centre the sort of the more standard if you like settlement uh, Pākehā settlement history more to the outskirts. Um, I also um, was really impressed with Cambridge Museum. Now I visited Cambridge Museum when we were first starting to think about how we would outreach museums. Um, so sort of 
in mid-2021 and they were saying how they had engaged with schools and schools had asked, you know, what can you do for us? And and they had, were really struggling with those questions. Well, roll on a year later when our um, colleague Michael visited, the solutions had, had been created, particularly in terms of the Te Oko Horoi Investigating Histories website, which we understand is a collaboration between the museum, between schools and the Kahuiako, and with support from local iwi. And, and I've really enjoyed going through that, that website to see what they've come up with, which is fantastic. So really what we what where we saw those successes were you know as Liz said in the support but also in the connections that are being made and another example would be Palmerston North which I think has capitalized on the fact that it's got a university and a few retired historians still living in the community but there's also been some fantastic connections made uh, with local rangatane uh, with the museum with the library and the schools and there's a, a really nice um, sort of ecosystem um, kind of creating there, which I guess in some ways relates to what we've seen of Tara's writing around that as well. So just finally, uh, we really just want to make some observations about what we've discovered across the museums and our impressions, particularly around the sustainability of resourcing local history and, and therefore sustaining local history in museums. And I suppose the biggest thing that we would keep coming up with is resourcing, resourcing, resourcing. Um, we've talked about the diversity of museums on the one hand, and, and that's great because they reflect the local context. But on the other hand, that diversity, particularly in terms of how museums are resourced, how they uh, are supported by um, local bodies um, or regional councils, etc., we also see is quite a risk um, in terms of the viability of sustaining those operations. And that's something that we've also really expressed to the ministry because we have um, had museums say to us, and an example with Hokianga, say, if we're we're struggling as we are. We have very little funding. We're volunteer run. They do it. They, it's an amazing museum. If, um, but we we don't know if we can continue, and particularly if there is more pressure put on us in terms of of delivering for the local curriculum. Um, the volunteer run museums we were absolutely fascinated with, and particularly around realising that a really high proportion of the volunteers are well into their 80s and 90s in age. And so amazingly energetic people working often full-time hours to keep their museum running, but it does bode questions around succession and how how those museums can can continue if that goodwill and energy um, can can't be kept up. Um, I also um, Tuako museums there to remind me of the beautiful the beautiful buildings we see that are often housing our particularly our smaller museums, but also that how vulnerable they are. So often having problems with ventilation, with leaking, with needing refurbishment, particularly after they've been around as museums for a few decades, earthquake proofing, um, earthquake um, closing because, because of earthquake risk, et cetera. So that also um, is a question that, that came up for us, that certainly arose for us in, in what we were um, who we were engaging with. And Helensville Museum particularly, that was a huge example where they'd had to clear out all of their buildings because of Bora, put all of their artifacts into freezers for a few months to kill it off and, and then put it all back, all done by volunteers as well. So, you know, we're just hugely in awe of the energy people put into museums, but at the same time, seeing that as, is only sustained as long as volunteers can continue to do it. So, so the questions about that. So really what we've found, I think, is that everything that we've seen comes down to the questions of relationships and leadership, um, both 
from within and outside to support the museums and particularly how local communities engage across the different areas and where those things are strong we're just you know are very excited about what's going on uh, and where they need help we we hope and we that's something we've expressed to the ministry that there will be resourcing to help with that so we've really come down to th realising the value of the connections and relationships and partnerships um, and, and thinking about how those can be developed to empower the museums to tell their local stories, but also have those museums looked after in the long run as well. So that's us for now. Thank you for listening and we'll welcome any questions. Sure. Thanks so much, uh, Liz and Carol. There was so much, so much information which you presented and some things that I probably hadn't thought about, about um, museums st establishing in the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s in some cases, and that tendency to around rural communities. If anyone's got questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, we'll feed them and, and you'll get hopefully responses from Carol and Liz if they can answer them any part time. But while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'm just going to throw this out there so either one or both can answer it. What was, was there anything that surprised you as you did your research? Anything you weren't expecting to come across and it was of a, you know, just gave you a surprise? Who's going to go first? I, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll come in. The volunteers absolutely fascinated me. Um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, just I wasn't aware of the extent that the sector is is held up by volunteer labour. Um, that might be naive, but I just hadn't realised. So that was my big learning, uh, and then the and and in hand in hand with the resourcing. Liz, what about you? Oh, mine was the the difference that a supportive local council can make to the heritage sector in their area. And like I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the form of large grants. It's about the signals that the the council sends around um, what they value. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it might be worth adding to that, that, Liz, your experience. So one of the things Liz did right at the beginning of the project oh, yeah. was ring round all the councils. I did. Yeah, so I rang. So I just started, like, we were thinking, okay, how do we work out who does local history? So I literally just got on the phone and I rang every single district or city council in New Zealand. And some of them were like, history what, what would councils have to do with that and some some people knew straight away who to put me on to and some and then patterns began to develop geographically actually around um you know there were areas where i couldn't find anyone to talk to and then when we visited those areas they were also often the areas where there were either and not a lot of museums or those that were there felt they were struggling um they lacked volunteers or um, they felt they lacked resources or, su or support in general. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, I think that I was really surprised. First of all, I was surprised by the fact that not, I mean, I've just been privileged. Live at, I, from my um, PPH, you know, I grew up in the Hutt Valley. Um, I've just always lived somewhere where local history has been really well supported by um, the local council so it was a bit of a surprise to me to find that what not every library has a heritage section not not every place has you know someone I can talk to yeah so yeah, it was quite interesting fantastic and volunteers are the backbone aren't they not only I think of the sector but really of our country in some ways with mm. the work they do so lovely lovely to see that come through and acknowledge it with them but also it's a, it's a state of state of where we're at too James from Auckland Museums asked a question. He's thanked you for the interesting presentation. And he says you focus focus mainly on visit to a museum, but what about online collections? For example, it is difficult for get to get senior secondary schools to visit, but here in Auckland, there's no way they can get through all the kids through the door. So I guess, um, yeah. So so did you look at online collections at all? Yeah, do you want me to answer yeah. that one, Carol? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so James, there are a couple of things. Um, Every 
library that had some form of Kite or other software, because um, I know Kite is uh, no longer in use. Um, I, we listed those as a resource for the ministry, partly because I sometimes think that secondary, I mean, this is actually probably more relevant to secondary schools, although also to teachers finding resources. I don't sometimes think they, I know I think of libraries, but that doesn't mean everyone thinks of libraries. Um, so yeah, so I went through, as I said, as part of that ringing, it, during that process, I actually looked at every council website and looked at who actually had online collections. Um, we alerted the ministry to things like eHive and Digital NZ, and I'm trying to think, I think those were the only two. Um, but I, I feel like it's, yeah, I, I kind of, I, I, because I, I think they're super important, and, and I find them super useful um, for teaching in my in my own work. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of it, because it was about local history. The ministry was really focused on those resources that just were in the local area, um, and there wasn't kind of space in our project for those. Because, um, for example, uh, Mana Tutonga also produces some really great online stuff, so. So yeah, um, that's kind of how we dealt with it. But I, I feel that there's more more to be explored in that space, and particularly as only more and more stuff's coming online. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and if I could just add to that, I think um, a real a, a common common story as we visited museums was them telling us about the point in the process that they are in, mm. in terms of trying to digitise. Yeah. Now, for yeah. some, digitisation was um, simply scanning documents and getting them at least scanned, uh, not online yet or anything like that. So various sort of stages with that. Um, that was where, for, in some examples, bringing in volunteer, particularly younger people who are a bit savvy, savvy -er, perhaps with the technology was really helpful to them but there were very few I would say who weren't trying to engage some way digitally it was just the resourcing and the time and the ability to do that yeah right and just our final two comments or questions that are coming through and they tie in nicely together um there's been a question asked is your report going to be shared with the glam sector and then that leads on to another question from Russell, Russell Business Association, who would like your permission to use your findings in a grant application for MCH uh, to engage professional museum officer, et cetera. So is your report going to be shared wider than the ministry? And if so, can the findings can be I, used? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I'd have to say that Northland, um, I found, you know, res resourcing, um, obviously a challenge um, across the region so yeah um, at this stage because we are contracted to the ministry we've we've just um, shared with them preliminary findings and that will become a finalized report and with that we'll then establish with them we we've never they've never talked about that these findings won't be made able to be made public but we haven't established exactly what that will be at this stage so hopefully this webinar um, as a recording that will be publicly available is something that is a starter for you in that respect um, and it doesn't detract from what we've written for the ministry but we are just establishing in terms of how we can uh, publish that and and more widely do it but it's absolutely something that we want to do mm -hmm. yeah yeah Fantastic. And if the report can be shared widely, we'll make sure that we send it out to Taputi Manatonga members through newsletters, through our Facebook page and things like that. Um, Liz and Carol, I just want to thank you both very much for your time today. And actually your time you've committed to this research. It's a, I, I started by saying it was an ambitious project and it was, but I think the data that you've collected and the conversations that you've had across the time that you've worked on this project are really rich and provide a not only an interesting snapshot of where we're at, but the need, I, you know, and I wear my education hat with this, when we're talking about local histories and histories in our curriculum and the, the, the role that cultural and heritage have to support that, there is a real need for funding from, um, from perhaps from the Ministry of Education to help out some of those spaces, particularly those smaller volunteer run ones, we know that they're being inundated with requests at the moment for support. There's a real genuine willingness 
but actually people can only work um, so far. So I think your research has highlighted that, it's highlighted the value of um, our volunteers in our sector, um, who I don't think we ever underestimate, but it's really highlighted their profile as well. But I wanna thank you both for your time and coming along and sharing this with us. I found it hugely informative and I, from the nods I can see from the people that have got their cameras on, I can see that they have too. So uh, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. We'll close with Karakia now, but just yeah, huge acknowledgements again, Carol and Liz. Um, just before we go to Karakia, a reminder that next week's webinar, we've got Nikita Ikihele coming in from Kia Mahira, who's talking about understanding influence. So these are our final set of webinars around personal empowerment. Um, if you came to Nikita's first one, you know she is a fantastic mentor and coach, so she'll be talking about that with us. That's next Thursday. 3rd of November, 3.30 p.m. And I will close with Karakia. Um, thank everyone again for coming, particularly Carol and Liz for sharing. Whakatakati hau ki te uru, whakatakati hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tāra tāra ki tai, i hi a ki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, te he Māori ora. Go well and have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon.